Now we're back this afternoon for uh, two more lectures, and what we're going to be talking about first is uh, the methodology, really, in investigating hauntings, the use of mediums and instrumentation, and I'm going to do that part. And then when um, I'm finished, uh, after the break, Carlos will come back and discuss some of the theories, and we brought up some of the theories this morning, um, <coughs> but there's a, a number of different ones, so we'll, we'll do that. The first transparency, we were talking this morning about um, the use of mediums. Eileen J. Garrett, who was the founder of, of this uh, institution, was a trans medium and did quite a lot of work. Um, um, well, she did just about everything that a trans medium would do, worked with experimenters, did all kinds of um, uh, readings for different people, and, and she also worked in haunted house and settings. In the magazine, when she came to New York, she was a, a multifaceted person. She was a trans medium. She was a businesswoman. She was a publisher. She founded the foundation with um, our co-founder, the Honorable Frances P. Bolton, who was a congresswoman from Ohio. And the two of them uh, set up the foundation in 1950 with the idea that this would be um, an institution that would bring together, put together a good research library, provide funding for research, provide venues for conferences, um, and basically investigate uh, the whole area that her ability had brought her into. Um, she was a very gifted medium. She had uh, quite a lot of successful, um, successful uh, readings and experiments and all kinds of things. She's a very interesting lady. We're bringing out in a couple of weeks her uh, one of her autobiographies, Adventures in the Supernormal, and that'll be available from us. And the book <coughs> we're having actually a book signing on Tuesday, the the 19th of March. Which if you're here in um, New York, you're welcome to join us. You have a card about it in your packet. What we wanted to talk about here, because we're talking about hauntings, is it is a case that Mrs. Garrett worked on called the Ash Manor case. This took place in the 1930s in England. Um, Dr. Elmer Lindsay, who you also see in this, uh, this transparency, was a colleague of Mrs. Garrett's. They were told about a, a, a manor house that was outside of London that was haunted. A family of three lived there, a husband, a wife, and a teenage daughter. The f uh, phenomena were mainly footsteps, pretty typical stuff and noises. But the husband was also seeing, standing at the window of his bedroom, um, a haggard older man in raggedy clothes, looking very sad and, and um, not very well. And he found that to be very difficult, and he wanted to get some insight into what was going on in the house. Sensibly, that was the idea. Um, Mrs. Garrett and um, Mrs. Coley, who was then Miss Garrett, and Mrs. Garrett's secretary and Dr. Lindsay went out to Ash Manor, this house, in the countryside to, to meet the family, uh, get to know them, find out more about the haunting, and see if during a seance um, uh, something would come through Mrs. Garrett's trans mediumship. Now there are a lot of different kinds of mediums, and the most famous today obviously is John Edward who's on television who basically just stands there and listens. Um, but in the era of Mrs. Garrett's most active work, the, the mediums, that, there were two types of mediums, mental mediums and physical mediums. Mrs. Garrett was a mental medium. She went into trance. She, she had um, a, a couple of controls. The one that was involved in this case was called Yuvani. He would come in and, and perform a function as kind of a gatekeeper, looking for the individual she wanted to talk to, bringing them through, protecting her. Um, and when she would awake from this trance, there would be verbatim, verbatim transcripts of everything that she had said during the, the session. But Mrs. Garrett herself had no conscious memory of the session. And this may be part of the reason why she always maintained this kind of pro-con sort of attitude towards her own abilities. She knew that she got information that could be verified that was very solid and very um, useful, but she wasn't really awake while she was getting or giving that information. So um, we have a famous quote that our boss is always happy to to uh, mention to anybody that Mrs. Garrett said that on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday she believed in all of this stuff, and on Tuesday, was it Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday she didn't, and on Sunday she just didn't give a damn. So she, she had that kind of, and this is good for us because there, that also came, um, out of that came this interest in furthering the science as well as furthering her mediumship. Um, they got out to Ash Manor 
And she was a very savvy person. She interviewed um, the members of the family, and she began to think, even though they had this sunny, hospitable disposition, that there was a current of tension under uh, underneath the way that they interacted with each other. A very interesting report on this case was published in Tomorrow Magazine, which Mrs. Garrett published, in which they combined a meeting that was held in 1952 with the principals of the investigation, Mrs. Coley, Dr. Lindsay, and Mrs. Garrett, using the transcripts and the materials that had been compiled when the case was investigated. When she went into trance, the very first phenomena that they report after Yuvani comes and introduces himself and talks about um, what he thinks is going on with the ghost and that he's going to be protecting um, the medium and that the people who are assembled should be telling this ghost, you, you're, you have to go now, you have to leave this place, you don't have to stay in this place. Um, and then she she became very rigid in her chair and started to struggle and point to her mouth as if she couldn't speak. And there were, according to the verbatim transcripts that they quoted in the, in the Tomorrow article, there was fully 15 minutes of this almost catatonic kind of struggling to get some word out. And the first words that came out, um, they couldn't understand initially, and then they realized that the ghost was saying, Kyrie eleison, Lord forgive me. They started to discuss with the, they started to get this guy to talk about his experience and the story that they pieced together was that he was a minor noble who had been incarcerated by the king, that his lands had been taken away, he didn't know where his son was, didn't know where his wife was, and that he'd spent 30 years in prison. And that he'd spent so long in this prison that the people who were taking care of him forgot why he was there. And at one point he had raised such a cry in, in the early part of his incarceration about what was being done to him that they'd slit his tongue to keep him silent. So he was never able to explain his situation to the people who were around him. And that was the information that came through. So they formulated a kind of a plan of how to, how to set him... Sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. How to uh, set him free. Um, and they returned to London. Oh, uh, well, the modern world. Uh, they returned to London. Now, one thing that's very interesting about this case is that the next day, Elmer Lindsay was sitting with another medium. And in the context of that seance, the medium, um, the very first thing that she did in his presence was go into this catatonic state, which looked to him exactly like the state that Mrs. Garrett had been in the night before, rigid body, struggling to speak, pointing to the tongue, and then the same kind of story. Um, ultimately, they they uh, realized there was a complication in the sense that the, one of the members of the family didn't really want this ghost to go. So they would convince the ghost, they thought they'd convince the ghost to go, and then he would say he was being brought back and that kind of thing. And eventually the family left the house and they went out to the house to kind of do a cleaning during which um, experience um, they had, they didn't come into con uh, contact with the ghost and felt that he had in fact moved on. Now, the thing about cases like these is when you read the descriptions, and there's a point in this description in Tomorrow Magazine where Mrs. Coley and Lindsay talk about the fact that Mrs. Garrett's face changed, and it changed to su in such a way that it seemed to them to be the face of this man, haggard and drawn. And when the, the percipient, the, the father of the family, was brought to see her in this state, he, re he said that he recognized his face. What's interesting to me about it is that there's two mediums also coming through with the same kind of information. But this, this kind of a case kind of falls into this cleaning variety in the sense that the purpose of the people who were investigating was not to validate absolutely everything. And the guy was a minor, was a minor nobleman of that era, it was 400 years before, and there was no attempt made to really verify every particular. S sometimes there are cases that use mediums where the distance in time is even longer than that. And this man's story made sense in terms of the historical facts of the time, but it wasn't verified. Um, Tony Cornell has used um, this Japanese medium, Mrs. Gibo, and one of the cases that she worked on for him was a, a cottage in a town called Ichneald, and the, the, this is described in his chapter three contemporary mediums in his book that we're bringing out. Um, and when she came to the house, it was interesting because one of the questions you ask when you see a case like Mrs. Garrett's not only is, is this true, can we verify this, but if it's true, where does the information come from? And the case of Mrs. Gibo with Tony Cornell is particularly interesting in, in that second regard. 
in the sense that he brought her to this house. She saw a man sitting on a couch in a riding habit, looking out the plate glass window. She saw a young boy with blonde curly hair lurking in the bushes who seemed to want to get into the house to get a gun. She saw carts and animals and a lot of noise going along a hedgerow by the side of the house that made her think of a road and made her jump back. And then she saw coming down, um, coming up the hill towards the house, a group of Roman soldiers in Roman dress with spears and so on. What excited Tony about this was that he had been investigating this case for some time, and the case had two aspects. One was that the family um, had had a number of experiences that were related to the Roman occupation, and they had found Roman ar artifacts on their property. One day when they were remodeling, the, they had a little manufacturing business, I think, in the back of the house. And the husband and some of his workmen came, and in the backyard they saw this group of legs and arms underneath these, sh these shields. And when, the, when the, one of the men came around to begin with, he came back and said, there's a giant turtle in the backyard. And they went back around, and for fully 10 minutes, people could see this apparition on the lawn, and then it disappeared. When Tony got the description of it, he said to the, the owner of the house, you realize that one of the Romans' typical um, methods of attack, particularly when they were trying to attack a building, was to get together in a very close formation and to surround themselves, the front, back, and sides, and over the top with their shields. So you would see these little leggies underneath and this sort of big gray metal mass mass as the people move towards the building. And it's, the Romans called it a tortoise. <coughs> so he felt that this was kind of validation that there was something Roman going on here. But they also reported another phenomenon, which, which was that when they were in the backyard, they would frequently look back to the house and they would see a face in the place, plate glass window. So this was another thing that Mrs. Gibo had picked up. Interestingly, the blonde, curly-haired boy looking for the gun in the bushes, they had been the, the um, target of a local delinquent a few years before who would come periodically and burgle the house, raid the house with his girlfriend. And what he was usually after was Mr. Mr. B, is how Tony called him. He had an air rifle, and the guy would come in and take jewelry and take whatever he could find and rummage around for the air rifle. The guy was sentenced to prison. When he got out of prison, he was a typical wild young man. He drank a lot, had a car accident, and he had died. So the family felt that she was picking up this boy's actions when he was alive and not that he was now haunting them later and Tony was asking the question where are they getting this where was she getting this information from then he began to try and validate some of the Roman stuff and discovered an old ordinance map from the early part of the 19th century that showed that the Roman road from I think it was Colchester which was a big Roman settlement off to another large Roman settlement settlement was literally right next to the hedgerow next to this bungalow. In fact, part of the bungalow sat on the Roman road. So there were all these piece, bits and pieces that came together, but there was still this question, where does the information come from? So when you work with mediums, you can get a lot of very useful stuff. But then, um, to put it together for an evidential purpose, you need to have kind of cross-validation. You need to have the mediumship results fit in with the results of of the experiencers, what they're having, what they're experiencing, the kinds of information you dig out in a historical um, investigation, and then now people are beginning to use instrumentation. Um, before you put them up there, one of the things we want to talk about is who does ghost research today. There are the scientific parapsychologists. William Roll, who you've probably seen on television, has been doing this for 30 years. Dean Radin, who's also a fairly uh, well-known experimental parapsychologist, has done quite a lot of these studies. But probably the most, um, most important in a lot of different ways were done by two New Yorkers, Gertrude Schmeidler, who was a uh, professor of psychology at City College here in New York, and her graduate student, Dr. McLean Mayer, got her PhD there and now teaches a course in parapsychology at New School. They um, brought a lot of innovations to the study of haunted houses, and one of the first things that they did 
was to bring in the floor plan method and we'll talk about that in a little bit when we get to the instrumentation. Now there's, so they're the scientific parapsychologists and they're very much interested in evidence so that's what their primary focus is. Then there are amateur groups and enthusiasts with very varying levels of training. I mentioned the group of, of there's a group in, uh, I think it's Georgia, of, of EMS, all retired EMS police and firemen, and they've put together an investigative group. And they try to bring the training that they used in their jobs to the, to the calls that they get, and they do this completely for free. There are groups of individuals who join as just as an avocation societies who train them in varying levels. When you get on the internet, it's really interesting to see some of the statements of who can join. Quite a lot of these groups will say, you must be serious, you must commit to so many weekends of working with us, you must commit to learning to use the equipment, you must not drink during investigation, you must not smoke during investigation, you must be, commit yourself to writing up your report and so on. So, and then they have training courses. So there are a lot of different ways of doing things. And we'll talk about one of what one of these ex these investigations look like in a second. And then there are people with specific agendas. And, and these can be people who, like the OSTs, have ministry behind in their minds. They want to they want to prove the survival of death. So they're really looking to get tangible evidence that ghosts exist, that the afterlife exists. And then there are people that are going to be rescuers. They they're concerned about the spirits that are caught there. They really believe that they're that in some of these hauntings there are individuals that are stuck in this transitional space, and they're providing counseling, literally to the to to the the manifestation to the spirit as well as counseling to the families and then there are some people in the country like Lloyd Auerbach who um, will be coming in in June to do some work for us who have who actually do this as a profession Lloyd's office of paranormal investigations has been around for more than 20 years I think and these are people who charge the same kind of money that a private investigator would charge they come in they do the investigation they see what's needed sometimes they'll move, change from science mode and move into counseling mode, move into mediumship mode, depending on what the family needs, what the people on the site need, and they charge the kind of money you would expect <coughs> to pay a regular um, private investigator. Then there are also other people out there that we won't talk about, that, um, you know, the kind of person who says, I know what you've got, you've got a ghost, and just pay me $10,000 and spread this powder and you'll be fine. Those are the people you don't want to have anything to do with. But I think the people who are sincere, whatever their approach is, far outnumber the other type. Now, what does a, what does a coordinated group investigation look like? The first time that we ever really heard about this was years ago. We went to a Society for Psychical Research convention in Bournemouth. It was Bournemouth, I think, in England, um, which was our first... SPR convention and they're a very very interesting group. They they range from 95 year old enthusiasts who have been investigating ghosts and hauntings since 190 something all the way to to you know 24 year old eager beaver graduate students who are doing a psychology degree and have parapsychology as part of the component. It's a very interesting mix of people. Among the groups that came to give talks at that particular convention was a group of young men, uh, some of them with college degrees, some of them not, most of them with military experience, who lived in the city of Cheltenham, where the Cheltenham ghost uh, case occurred that Carl's talked about this morning. And they had come together to make a, a group called the Cheltenham Ghost uh, Research Society. And the thing that they did that we weren't aware of was they set up their ghost investigations, their site investigations, like a military operation. They would send eight people, 12 people, people into a site. They'd walk around the site in buddies, you know, two, two, two by two. They had walkie-talkies to stay in touch with each other. They had infrared cameras. They had video equipment, photography, um, meters for electromagnetic fields and static fields and things like this. So everything that they could think of that they might need, make the floor plan, and then they would do vigils and check in at particular moments. The one case that he talked about, um, was not was a case in which the haunting was supposedly a ghost, a wispy ghost of a woman in one of the upstairs bedrooms, and that was the only phenomena that had been reported in the house. So they were taking turns sitting for two hours in the dark in the upstairs bedroom. Well, as the night wore on, it was it's England. It got pretty cold and rainy and wet and horrible, and so the people downstairs in the main room built a fire in the fireplace. And a few minutes later, the folks in the haunted bedroom started to shout that the ghost had appeared and was making her way across the room. Well, then they started asking on the walkie-talkies, who, 
who, what's going on in the rest of the house, you know, what's happening. And they realized that what was happening was the seal on the side of the fireplace in the second bedroom had a slight crack in it. And whenever you made a fire in the drawing room on the first floor, the smoke would come up and then filter out that seal in a long line and then kind of wander around the room until it dissipated. They have other, ex other experiences, other site investigations that had a more paranormal outcome. But this was a very interesting experience for us to see how useful this kind of site investigation can be. And also how professionally these guys were putting it together. Now Gertrude Schmeidler had developed this idea. She wanted to be able to take the claims of experiencers in haunted houses and submit it to statistical analysis to be able to say, you know, everybody that comes in here has a, a similar experience or maybe if we bring in a medium they'll have the same kind of experience. But instead of saying this looks the same, how do we quantify it like we would do in a scientific experiment? So they started using the floor plan methodology. Migleen Mayer, Mayer still does these kinds of investigations and she will typically bring in an architect to do the floor plan so that the floor plan is absolutely perfect. The first step is to get the people who live in the house to mark the spots on the floor plan where they've encountered the ghost or where they felt a presence. The second step is to have the people who've experienced the ghost fill out a personality questionnaire. Is he happy? Is he sad? Is he, is he looking for something? Is he, you know, they have a little checklist and you cross off the stuff that doesn't apply to the ghost, you circle the stuff that does. Um, and then the next thing to do is to bring in a group of sensitives, Gertrude likes to call them sensitives, and they can be mediums, they can be psychics, they can just be ordinary people who say, I've had this kind of experience before, I think I'm going to be able to detect something. And then another group of people who are controls, who don't believe this kind of stuff happens, can't feel anything, never had a haunted experience in their lives. And they all go through this house separately, marking on the same plan where they feel phenomena, where they experience phenomena, and filling out the same questionnaire about the personality of the ghost. And then she normally has them, mediums weave a tale or the sensitives weave a tale later about what they think is really going on with this ghost and what's the motivation and so on. Another thing that Michelin Mayer has done is that she'll take in com uh, random number generators, which is a kind of uh, testing the device that's used in psychokinesis research. She'll do a lot of photography and then you'll map out all those pieces of information, whatever sensor reading you get, on that same floor plan and take a look at where is everything piling up. In one experiment, for instance, she found that in the spots where people had seen ghosts, photographs taken of those spots had photographic anomalies significantly more often by a statistical technique than places where no ghost was seen. So there was something being objectively taken from that spot when they went through with the photographing. They found that the mediums were and the sensitives were um, significantly better than the controls at picking the ac actual spots that the family had had experiences in. They were pinpointing where the ghosts had actually been. They were only they were better but only a little bit better than the controls at, at attributing personality to the ghost. And Mickey began to talk about the notion that we all have an idea of what a ghost is supposed to be. They're supposed to be sad, they're supposed to be stuck, they're supposed to be confused, they're supposed to be... So there was a certain amount of description that everybody would come up with, they come up with when they talked about ghosts. The sad thing was that a lot of the mediums that they used in that study, unlike Mrs. Gibo or Mrs. Garrett or some other people, was that when they began to spin the tale about what the ghost was like and what it wanted and what it needed, it didn't match at all any of the other research that was going on about what was happening in the house and it didn't match the experiencers' um, reports of what the ghost was doing and what it seemed to want. And one of the reasons why that might be true is that there is a problem with some mediums, and we've heard this here, where, where you'll say, well, how do you get feedback? How do you train yourself? How do you learn what you're doing? Mrs. Garrett was very concerned about that and did a lot of training very early in her career and was always worried about how right or how wrong she was. She was actually at a disadvantage that um, modern mediums who aren't trans mediums don't experience, which is that she was in trance when she had those experiences. So it might be difficult to figure out what's right, what's wrong. But if you're a medium that gets waking information and you're not getting feedback, then it's difficult for you to say, okay, it feels like this when I'm right. It feels like this when I'm wrong. And we've actually had, there was actually someone here that I said, well, what do you do about feedback? And this is the first time, the only time I've ever heard that, but she said, oh my dear, I never asked them if I'm right. Why would I want to know? You know, well, I can think of a number of reasons why you would want to know so that you can improve.
Um, let's see. Okay, I did Tony. Now we talked about there's different agendas that everybody has, but it, but it's interesting that even with the different agendas, some of the research is very very similar. And one of the sad things that happens today is that scientific parapsychologists in general, and Carlos and I don't include ourselves in this group, are very negative about the enthusiasts and the ghost hunters and the amateurs and the professionals that are out there doing the field research. Um, and I think it's a shame because parapsychology is in a state like other sciences have been at, at stages in their development that we need that data and we need to understand that people who do field investigations and field research get a kind of craft knowledge that's much more, um, it, it's much more deeply entrenched, it's much more knowledgeable about the actual experiences about what works and what doesn't work in an investigation and when our community cuts ourselves off from the people who are actually in the field, we lose a lot. And they also suffer because we've heard that from a lot of the ghost researchers that they don't like to talk to scientific parapsychologists because they say, oh, you don't have a PhD? Well, mm -hmm. <laughs> when they've been in the field for 25 years and really know how to carry out these these um, investigations. So that's something that we're trying to work towards a rapprochement between the two groups because I think there's a lot of important data out there that I'd like to see get into the hands of the physicists in our community and a lot of respect that needs to be built up in our community for the work of the people who are in the field. Now we're going to talk about instrumentation. So if you would put up this wonderful photograph. Yeah, Raynham. People have been using photographs for these kinds of things since the beginning of time. Um, unlike uh, the Cheltingham ghost and the old cumbersome camera, who the Cheltingham ghost wouldn't stand still long enough, as the technology improved, it was more easy and more likely that you might catch something anomalous on, on film. This is from 1936. It was published in a magazine called Country Life. It was taken at Raynham Hall, which is a stately home in England. There's quite an interesting <coughs> article about it in the Stately Homes of England book that's around here, and it pops up frequently in the literature. Raynham Hall is reputed to be uh, haunted by a woman who lived there, I think, in the 18th century. They call her the Brown Lady. So there's a portrait in one of the upstairs bedrooms um, of a lady in a brown dress with a yellow ruff that is supposed to be the, the ghost of the place. And a a wonderful story in a book we have here in the library called Noted Witnesses for Psychic Occurrences by um, Frederick Marriott, who was a, a writer, about the experiences that he had in that, in that, uh, in that house, coming face to face with a ghost. The, the two gentlemen that took this picture were actually taking photographs of this staircase for architectural, for remodeling purposes. They were going to redecorate this por portion of the house. They had seen, I think, something wispy around them, but at the moment that they took this picture, they weren't seeing anything. And when they, when they, um, when they developed it, then they had this figure of a ghost. There are a lot of, of photographs like this, and, and so photo cameras tend to be a very important part of what goes into the field. There's a complication today. I mean, you see in the old manuals, investigating manuals, what type of camera you should have, if it's infrared, what kind of film, what kind of developing, etc. Now people take digital cameras, and a digital camera adds a, a, a layer of, of complication. You can take it home, put it into Photoshop, do whatever you want to it, no one's going to be able to s tell that the original photograph has, has actually been altered. You can't see where the original one starts and the other one ends. Um, in, in some of these photos, some of the old spirit photos, you could at least take a look if something had been superimposed. You could see if it was on the negative. There were other things that you could do to look for fraud, but as people use digital cameras, you can't do that. So it's interesting to see, like on the International Ghost Hunter Society website, they say if you're going to send us a digital photo, you have to tell us what kind of a camera you took it with, what were all the stop speeds and the illumination and everything, and then you have to tell us what kind of software did you use it on? Did you do, did you do any changing to it? Did you lighten it? Did you brighten it? Did you, did you do something to the way that the image was was there, and that's put in the description of the photo so that people who see the photo can decide whether or not this is an augmented photo or if this is something that's kind of evidential. Um, people are also taking video cameras and now digital video cameras, so now there's a whole set of rules about how you use that, and we'll see that in the tape. People take tape recorders, that's been done for a long time. Um, looking for not only just, not only information 
are not only sounds of the haunting, like distant doors banging or footsteps or moaning or whatever, but also leaving them as security devices. Um, in a minute, I'm going to show you a, a picture of Tony's instrument pack, Tony Cornell's instrument pack, and when he was called in by NBC with Bill Roll to investigate the RMS Queen Mary, which is now in Dry Dock in California and is a hotel and is reputed to be haunted, one of the things that they did with tape recorders was to leave tape recorders that were voice activated in the, in the quote unquote hot spots, not just to catch go ghost sounds, but to catch staff members because the, the ship was so large and there were so many people wandering back and forth and they were getting so many stories about no, we never go down there or no, no, that couldn't be anybody from the staff in the pool. People don't, we're not supposed to swim in the pool. So they would set things up so that they could catch people. And in fact, at one point, they caught a crowd of young men, you know, down in one of the, one of the alleys that they weren't supposed to be in. And so they can be used in different ways. Then now, recently, there's been a very big interest in electromagnetic fields. There's some research in neuropsychology that suggests that being exposed to electromagnetic fields can produce hallucinations in people. And there's also some theory, Carlos will talk about it, about some theory about the idea that the presence of ghosts is connected with electromagnetic fields. So it's kind of the chicken and the egg. You don't know what came first. But it's obviously a very important thing. Um, in one of Dean Radin's exper experiments, which was uh, uh, shown by sightings um, some years ago, the, it, was, it was presented in a way that he was very unhappy with because he had felt that in some parts of the building there was real phenomena, and in other parts of the building um, the, the sleeping quarters of one of the caretakers was right on the other side of the wall from a huge trans, uh, transformer for the electrical lines. And he felt very sure that the upstairs phenomena were connected to these high EMF fields and that they were hallucinatory. Whereas in other parts of the building, he was not so sure. He was, you know, there was a real possibility there was a haunting in the other parts of the building. But it was presented as if the whole place was haunted, which is also what happened with the Queen Mary investigation. Um, people are also using closed circuit TV and monitors. You'll see that in the films that we're going to look at. And that's if you have a smaller team. You don't need to have 22 people, everybody with a walkie-talkie, if you can set up closed circuit TVs in the hotspots and monitor them from somewhere else. Can we have the next? One of the things that Tony Cornell did, which is um, was very creative, and you can tell he took this picture in the 80s because it's not so high-tech, um, and he started doing this in mediumship investigations. He got one mediumship circle that was producing physical phenomena of a pr fairly high order to allow him to set up kind of an in instrumentation pack so that he could film um, what they were doing and get a handle for himself on whether or not this was fraudulently produced or really produced. I'll, uh, he asked Mrs. Garrett for a grant and she gave him some money and he developed his first instrumentation pack and then the mediumship circle decided no they didn't want the cameras so he never got to use it. But out of that and with Howard Wilkinson who you'll see in the next set of pictures, he developed this kind of rolling um, um, instrumentation unit that he calls SPIDER, the Spontaneous Psychophysical Incident Data Electronic Recorder. I think he worked really hard to get something to turn into SPIDER. And it's in two or three versions. It's been in two or three versions since the 1980s. Um, it generally includes voice activated uh, tape recorder, a little computer setup, um, things for electromagnetic, um, things that he can use to hook up if he wants to make an electrical contact to close something to make sure it stays closed and he's got something that will activate a camera if it opens. It's hooked up to cameras and then he can have monitoring equipment either off-site or in another room all of which is sealed. And it gives him a way of investigating a site without having to stay at that site. One of the problems is everybody's got real jobs. You know, everybody has day jobs. So you certainly couldn't commit, like this group in the 19th century, a year of your time to live in a haunted house. And then there's the funding problem, which Tony has, has often mentioned, that the SPR just doesn't have a budget to buy every haunted house in England so we can turn it over for our own research use. So to have something that you can leave in place and go home and have supper and come back tomorrow and check it is really important. Um, and there are a lot of different kinds of, of this kind of methodology being used. If you show the third one. This is, this was taken, um, I had another one from a poltergeist case, but I don't want to muddy the waters here. This was the investigation of 
of the um, RMS Queen Mary. Howard Wilkinson, who's in the top photo, is actually standing inside the pool on the pool deck. What was being told to um, the investigators was that there were phantom swimmers, and sometimes you could come into the pool area and hear people laughing and giggling, and then you would see foot or footprints walk away from the pool in the water and go into the changing area. Um, so one of the things he did to investigate that claim was to set up spider, his spider pack in the pool area with instrumentation, voice activated cameras, that kind of thing, so he could catch anybody coming into the pool area. What, he no what they noticed when they came back to take a look at the equipment was that when the pool recycled occasionally, it, the, it would gurgle up in such a way that it would splash at the far end of the pool. And one of the things that Tony does and a lot of field investigators do is they reenact like crazy. If you say, okay, I saw the ghost at the window and the ghost got up and it walked over here, it took about 10 seconds and then it pulled this down and it did that, Tony and his group reenact it. They time it. They decide whether or not this is reasonable. And one of the things they did in this case was to see how many people could actually see a footprint on the other side of this Olympic size pool and discovered nobody could see a footprint. And basically it was a combination of the sound and then the splashes that made people believe it. Plus he found out from some of the staff that actually, yes, people were donning their bathing suits and sneaking down to the pool when the boss wasn't looking. Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to break for the people who are here and we can stop the filming and we're going to take a look at four videos that show us a little bit about the type of field research that's being done today. When we come back for the sake of the people who buy this as a video course, I will first describe what we saw in the videos before we talk about actually what's there. Okay, let me come. Okay, now what I'm going to do just is briefly talk about these four videos that we saw. One of the reasons why we include videos in the on-site courses is that in addition to our 10,000 books and 100 journals and magazines, we have 400 videos and audio tapes upstairs in the film archive. We try to get as much stuff as we can off the television. Um, the film archivist is also looking for research tapes, things that are filmed during research convention presentations, all kinds of stuff. So we have a pretty big collection. And it's wonderful to go through and see some of, some of what's presented. Because of the amount of money that it costs to do a lot of the on-site investigations, frequently groups will cooperate with uh, television shows like Encounters and Sightings and um, In Search of and those kinds of things to get the cash to be able to really go and do an investigation. Tony had a situation where a very haunted castle in England was presented to him by some of the locals but the BBC was unable to get permission from the people who owned the property to mount an investigation and it would have been impossible to do it without this extra funding. So we saw four tapes. The first one was um, what Tony Carnell thinks is the best depiction of the Bell Hotel case, showing him with his spider equipment and an overnight investigation. Unfortunately, they caught nothing on their monitoring equipment, and there were a couple of inaccuracies in the sense that the presenter was presenting the local myth about how the haunting was caused, for which there's no objective evidence. Um, but Colin Mitchell did get his story out, and they were able to show the environments and show what, what is done by <coughs> investigators. So um, that was one of the first ones. The Selma ghost, <coughs> we were very interested in um, mainly for um, the last experience of the cameraman because something was caught on tape and caught on tape by someone who was skeptical and was not expecting to find anything. And that we thought was a, was a, a very interesting um, um, side effect of the fact that camera crews go off with investigators and the camera crews are not ghost enthusiasts and if they do experience something that's that's interesting for us to hear about. The Lee and Oster tape um, of the of the luminous uh, the luminous lights in the film we thought was interesting because it was being evaluated by a special effects person. Um, can't comment on on the validity or not of the of the tape that he rejected. Certainly, that person is known to be very um, positive towards the phenomenon. 
you know, I, I'm sure if he thinks he believes in that tape that, that we're certainly not going to impugn it. But it shows you what a special effects person looks for. They look for the orbs or the lights interacting with the environment in a way that's natural, normal. Maybe that's a good thing to do and maybe it's not a good thing to do. But it shows you some of the visual phenomena that, that, that's caught. Um, and the fourth one, which is the, 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 this overpowering mist in the basement of this haunted mansion, um, is taken from another Ghost Hunters television show and we just presented it because we love that tape and we have no idea what that is and it was very um, impressive to the people who were experiencing it and it was impressive to us. So the point then is in, in when ghost investigations are done you want to get as much data as you possibly can from every front you can, from every source you can, um, not just photographs and instrumentation but mediums and experiencers and people that come along to do the filming wherever you can get um, information and you pile up all this data and you publish it in journals and books and here it is and the, then the next question is okay so what does it mean? So um, what we're going to do now is we're going to, if you need a, a couple of minutes to take a break, we'll take a quick break and then Carlos is going to come back in the last section of the course. We'll be talking about the various theories behind ghost, ghost and haunting phenomena because there are a lot of different theories and there isn't good evidence um, for every, every theory and you have to look at every case in terms of the theories because what could be an explanation for one case may not be an explanation for another case and if it's a complex case with a lot of different phenomena like bangs and whistles and noises and apparitions and so on each of the individual phenomena that are reported could have different causes and there could be a mix of natural things, misinterpretations and real phenomena in every single case. So the, the next part of the course will deal with the question of okay, what does it all mean? All right. Let's now start with the last part of the course, which is, you know, in some ways the most interesting, in other ways the most difficult, which is how do we explain all of this phenomena? Uh, traditionally, parapsychology always has had problems with explanations. You know, there are always exceptions to some explanations. Some of them apply to some cases, others apply to others. Uh, we, we have really a bad track record in terms of reliable and good theories. And I think part of the problem is, first, this is a very difficult area to study. And second, there are very few people that are doing the type of stuff that you saw there on, on tape. If you compare the number of people that have done these investigations in the last 10 years, we say people that work in physics or in biology or any other areas, you'll find that it's only a handful of people doing this stuff, or there are thousands of people doing physics doing psychology. The more people you have, the more resources there are, the more you learn about any phenomena. We don't have that in this area. We have just few people and they're independent of each other, there's no coordination, there is no money to do a lot of the research. So when there are no resources, theory always stays behind. That we have seen in many other areas of science and I think it's part of the problem that we see here. But we, we have developed some interesting ideas, some interesting concepts to explain this phenomena, we always start with the more obvious and the more simple, which are conventional explanations. Are, are there, is there anything conventional, meaning from the principles that science accepts, from common sense, that can explain a lot of these things? And you can start from, from people basically inventing tales, you know, saying, I saw a ghost and they really didn't see the ghost. As simple as that sounds, that sometimes is very hard to rule out. It's very difficult, you know, just to say this is a real case, this is a fraudulent case. In psychical research we have found that in some of these cases, sometimes they can be a mix of a little of fraud and a little of genuine phenomena. I just have a question, it's sort of off the subject but not really. Why yeah. do you feel there's so little money in this country for this sort of research? Like Russia has money. I mean, I know, you know, politics and all that, but I, I just wonder, I have no experience in this. Stuff. Yeah. I think there's no profit in it. I mean, what you find out is not going to bring you additional <laughs> money. In America, <laughs> we're a capitalist society. We want to invest money in something that's going to make money. Well, let's say you could use uh, mental or psychic energy to light a light bulb or to do something. Uh, right. It is profit. Well, the, this, yeah. we, we can get that into the, in the question and answer <laughs> in a period. I, I didn't want but, to 
But, but sorry, it, it, it is it's a problem. When you are in this field and you try to get money, there is very little money to be found. And uh, yeah, there are many reasons and uh, it's a... It's a problem. We, we can come back there in the question and answer because it's, it's, a, it's a valid question and, and it's very important because if it's really affecting and holding us back, we need to talk about it. But, but certainly it's, a, it's one of the practical things in life. You know, here we are with all these fascinating things, things with very high spiritual implications, human potential, all these things, and then we're put back down to earth because there is no money. So that, that's, that's one of the problems that this field has to... But let, let's go back, uh, just remind me of that at the end and, and we'll, we'll see what we can... But anyhow, we have to start with the normal. There are many cases that have normal explanations. There are some sounds that you can trace to a tree branch, you know, he hitting the side of a house. There are cases that have been found to be like that. Children sometimes commit fraud in cases of this, or, or other people. There have been cases of children that want the attention of the parents, and that has been found out in af after the child is found, and they talk to him or her, why did you do this? Why were you throwing the objects or doing these sounds? And so, some of them just need attention. The thing is that if you do a good investigation and you check out things, it should become obvious from the beginning that that is an explanation. When it is difficult to detect that, it's for people that are here really in very emotionally involved in the case. That usually the parents of a child sometimes cannot conceive their child doing something wrong. Because, you know, they know little Johnny and they know that little Johnny would never do something like that. But they don't realize that little Johnny is really feeling bad because there is a new baby in the family and all of a sudden little Johnny is number two. And then he, he knows that the parents are interested in ghosts and hauntings because they watch these things on TV. So they invent something like that to, to create attention towards them because it only happens in their room. There are cases like that. But again, I think if, if you go in there and you see the situation and you talk to people as an outside investigator, uh, those things you can rule out. But it's a question of always keeping them in mind. We also need to understand that human testimony is problematic. As human beings, we have all sorts of problems dealing with memory, for example, remembering something that happened. There are plenty of studies showing that when people have witnessed an accident and they come to talk about it, uh, the way they give an account of what happened depends on many, many factors, one of them being their motivation. Do they know the person that was affected by the accident? Uh, how are the questions asked by a, a later investigator about what happened? You know, there are ways of having leading questions, of confusing the, the witness. That can happen in the same way here. If someone comes and, and starts saying, this is a malignant spirit, isn't it? You, you, you know that, don't you? You already put people to think on that, on that wavelength, that this is an entity that is malignant, and the type of answers that you give may start being leaning more towards that explanation without you noticing it because the influence of someone that is seen as an authority, someone, a famous investigator, someone that you respect, that you have seen on TV, all of a sudden that famous guy is in your living room, those things have effects in the way data are collected. That's why, you know, the, you, you always can control by that, by having different people, having the interviews, having a team of researchers, watching on tape the interviews later on, just being self-critical. But you first have to start with ruling out the conventional. You cannot start assuming there are spirit entities or psychic forces or other stuff without really checking out the obvious. And many cases fall down after checking the obvious. That's, that's, that's the first thing to do. But then if, after you pass that, and there are many cases in our literature, like I think the Cheltenham case and some of the cases that Nancy was summarizing, that I think they really require some other explanation. How, how do we account for them? Well, you heard on the days many of these uh, researchers saying that they are convinced that these are spirits of people that lived on Earth at one point and then died, spirits of deceased individuals. That's the oldest explanation on record for these things, in some ways the most simple, uh, and it's one, but at the same time, extremely difficult to prove scientifically. How, how do we go on making sure that this is really a spirit of, of a deceased entity. That's why it's so important when you have a case like this, if someone sees a figure, ask the question, can we identify that person? 
The description that you are giving of that ghost, does it correspond with someone that lived there before? That's the first step. If you have a case that you can check out everything, then your interpretation that this may be a spirit is strengthened. You can never prove these things 100%, but you have to look for little details of that sort. Are the things being said by the medium in the case, can you check them out? And what you do is you basically construct a composite of details, you know. Here you have the basic claim, and you basically put together all the pieces of the puzzle, and you basically do a judgment at the end, which in, in these cases is the whole evaluation, ultimately, like in many other areas, is very subjective. You have to weigh in your own mind the value of each pieces of evidence and decide if you think that this indicates more the presence of what you think will be a spirit or not. In parapsychology, traditionally, there has been a deadlock in the issue of can we show that there is some discarnate agency or influence from spirits or, or not. And many parapsychologists frankly say we don't think we can show that, even in cases that are really good, uh, there are always problems because there are other alternative explanations. Some people will say, well, the object is being moved. Maybe that's not a spirit. Maybe that's an energy that is coming out from the body of someone that lives in the house. But in spiritualism and in the European spiritist tradition, they will also argue, yes, it is a force that is coming from a body, but the force is manipulated by a spirit. So here, here you have, you know, these things, these ideas become extremely complicated. Spiritism in Europe, the tradition of Allan Kardec, will tell you that there is a, a physical body that is inside you, that is located between the physical body and the spirit. This, this is a bridge between these two bodies. The spirit being completely non-material, the physical body being extremely material. In between, you have a body that is quasi-electrical, magnetic, and that is the force that spiritists will tell you, they call the peri-spirit, that will go out and do all kinds of physical actions. And they think that spirits manipulate that and use it. And to show that is extremely difficult. It's basically a belief. But what parapsychologists will say is not, there is no such thing as an outside spirit using the energy. It's basically some unknown energy, probably manipulated by the mind of some person there in the house, that is causing the phenomena. So there you have you know, all, all kinds of conceptual fights that, it, that even to, to today, the field of survival research, survival of bodily death, they have not been able to resolve the issue scientifically. There is no, no way of making a very clear difference. However, all of these phenomena show a lot of details that make people be better convinced to one side or the other such as uh, apparitions, like the ones, the pictures that we show, that can be identified, or relationships between haunted house phenomena and deaths that happen in a family. I talked at the beginning about the work of the Italian Ernesto Bozzano, and I want to read you a little uh, section of uh, a translation that, that I did and that was published in our journal, the International Journal of Parapsychology, about some of the stats that he got about the issue of death and hauntings. That meaning, was there a previous death in that house that was related to the manifestations later? And he's talking about, and I'm quoting, uh, for example, in an initial group of 180 cases, the origin of the, haunted, of the haunting coincided with a tragic event that occurred in the same place. In a group of 27 cases, the absence of documentation was replaced by the discovery of human remains that were buried or walled in at those places, a clear sign of unknown bloody dramas. In a third group of 71 cases, the precedent will be limited to the fact of the occurrence of any death in the locale. And in the fourth group of 26 cases, the deceased person that manifests did not die in the haunted locale, but live in them for a long time. Consequently, from a total of 374, in 304, there is, coinciding with the haunting, the precedent of a case of death. There are 70 cases left in which this does not exist, or to be more exact, there is no knowledge of it. 
So he, he basically compiled many cases published up to about 1919, which is when he does this analysis originally. And he finds that in many cases, there is some type of association with death. If there is no direct evidence, sometimes they will find a skeleton in the cellar or in some place that suggests that someone died there and that is related to the manifestation. That, that type of finding is usually utilized by the defenders of the spirit idea. If someone died there, it's, it's obvious you know, that you should expect that if the spirit can hang in the place, then apparitions, objects, wraps, all these kinds of movements, maybe they will be produced. But what you're showing is only an association between an event, death, and the phenomena. Again, not, as I said, not everyone is, is convinced of that, because there, there could be many other explanations. Going back to a comment that was made before, was the whole idea that okay, the phenomena are real, things really happen, but maybe they are not spirits, and by spirits we are saying conscious entities that are hanging around, that are directing the course of this phenomena, what could be happening is that it is possible in some places that certain human energies get stored in the walls of a house, in the surroundings of a place, and that later on someone comes in into those surroundings, someone that has the ability to decode that image. Just as we put a voice on magnetic tape or on videotape, if we have the proper instrument, we can play that out. But most of us, if we hold a video in our hands, we will not see or hear anything. That's for sure. But the idea here is that in a, in a small proportion of people, talking in terms of the general population, have this ability of going into a place and reading emotions and events that have been recorded in the environment. That's why some people call the trace theory of hauntings, or others call it the psychometric idea. Psychometric comes from the word psychometry, which is long used from spiritualism to psychical research. Psychometry being the ability of holding an object and getting the history of the object or the owner just through physical contact. The theory behind it is that energy from a person gets stored in some way that we don't understand, and the sensitive person gets that information out and can give you a reading about that person hol holding a a, a key or a piece of clothing and just start talking to you. In the hunting situation, what authors of that follow this model are saying is that that's exactly what is happening, but it's not a conscious process. It's that you just enter the place and you suck up that energy, you are being influenced by it without your knowledge. And what you are seeing is basically a replay of events that happened a long time ago. The idea says that the, the more emotional those those original events were, the stronger the impression. And that's why the trace theory people will say that is why you have all those death cases in the in hauntings. Because death is one of the strongest uh, things, the emotions that can happen and the energy goes out and gets imprinted and someone later uh, can read that out. So here you have the same, the same fact, the fact that there is a lot of death cases in the old literature is interpreted in two different ways. Some people say, well, it's death, that means a spirit is there doing, doing things. Others will say, yeah, death happened and that caused some energy to remain there that is later affecting the environment. So that, that's another uh, possible explanation. Other people even talk about telepathy. There was a psychical researcher of the 19th century, Frank Podmore, that didn't believe in any of the above explanations and he said, what happens here is that people that come to the house, the, the people that originally live in the house and know the story of what happened, they later move and new people come in. And these people that are living now in a different place telepathically are affecting at a distance the new owners of the house. So all those ghosts that they are seeing are basically caused by telepathy from the people that knew about the deaths and the problems that the house had before. That's again another way of explaining it. So here we have, you know, many different interpretations, and the thing is, what to do with, it, with them? Well, in reality, none of them can be said to be established. But I think a, a very useful way of seeing these things is to take it like Bozzano said in the old days, a more recent parapsychologist, Carlis Osis, who died, died a few years ago, uh, was arguing, was the idea that like, let's take, they will say, let's take all these ideas one by one and see how the cases that we have on record uh, fit into the ideas. 
And the, the, the general concept being that maybe we should not try to say that one of these concepts explains everything. That maybe we're dealing with a whole different types of hauntings. That some hauntings may be spirits of the dead, but others may be just a replay of energy stored in the environment. The thing is how to make a difference. You have to go case by case and study the features of the case. W one example is the whole issue are apparitions, these ghosts that we have been talking about, like the Cheltenham ghost, or that apparition that we saw in the, you know, the young girl, you know, with the wreath, the blonde girl in, in the videotape, are those conscious, disconnected people, are, are those spirits there, standing there thinking, here I am, I'm a spirit, I'm visiting the hotel, let's see who I'm going to scare now. You know, they're conscious that they are beings and they're going to interact with you. Uh, a lot of spiritists and spiritists will say that's what happens and that's what explains the intentionality of the manifestations and the spirit is trying to communicate, is trying to ask for something, or is just having a great time. But the, the issue is there is a real entity there thinking. If that's not the case, you should get certain type of phenomena like attempts to communicate. If you bring a medium, there should be an intelligent communication. You should, you should expect certain intentional phenomena Similar to if you yourself were in a room and you wanted to do all those, all those acts. You know, you have a motivation, so you have to look for phenomena that show motivation. And there are cases like that. You know, there are cases where in a haunted house, uh, the objects that get moved or affected are the objects that were related to the person that died. But the other objects that are more neutral and they don't have much interest, they're not affected as often. That will be the type of thing consistent with the idea that there is some consciousness trying to manifest. And of course, some of the cases where there is some attempt of communication, more direct through raps, you know, sounds like this, or through the apparition, and they're not so frequent, but they exist. Cases like that, you have to look to support the, that model. If you go for the trace theory, where the idea is, that figure that is there, or whatever is there, doesn't have any consciousness. It's just a playback, like a magnetic tape. There is information stored, but there is no entity there thinking consciously that they're going to do anything. If that is the case, then the theorists will say, well, we should find out cases where the ghost is a mechanical figure. You just see a ghost that walks from one corner to the other, never talks to you, never looks at you. If you are in front of it, it will go through you, or it will not acknowledge your presence. And the phenomena seem to be kind of one after the other with no, no specific sense. Also with, with routines. There are many cases, you know, where you, you hear the same sounds over and over again. The figure is in the same place. The psychometric theory will exactly ex predict that. You Again, not, as I said, not everyone is, is convinced of that because there, there could be many other explanations. Going back to a comment that was made before was the whole idea that okay, the phenomena are real, things really happen, but maybe they are not spirits, and by spirits we are saying conscious entities that are hanging around, that are directing the course of this phenomena. What could be happening is that it is possible in some places that certain human energies get stored in the walls of a house, in the surroundings of a place, and that later on someone comes in into those surroundings, someone that has the ability to decode that image. Just as we put a voice on magnetic tape or on videotape, if we have the proper instrument, we can play that out. But most of us, if we hold a video in our hands, we will not see or hear anything, that's for sure. But the idea here is that in a, in a small proportion of people, talking in terms of the general population, have this ability of going into a place and reading emotions and events that have been recorded in the environment. That's why some people call the trace theory of hauntings, or others call it the psychometric idea. Psychometric comes from the word psychometry, which is long used from spiritualism to psychical research. Psychometry being the ability of holding an object and getting the history of the object or the owner just through physical contact. The theory behind it is that energy from a person gets stored in some way that we don't understand, and the sensitive person gets that information out and can give you a reading about that person hol holding a, a, a key or a piece of clothing and just starts talking to you. In the hunting situation, 
what authors of that follow this model are saying is that that's exactly what is happening, but it's not a conscious process. It's that you just enter the place and you suck up that energy. You are being influenced by it without your knowledge. And what you are seeing is basically a replay of events that happened a long time ago. The idea says that the, the more emotional those, those original events were, the stronger the impression. And that's why the trace theory people will say that is why you have all those death cases in, the, in hauntings. Because death is one of the strongest uh, things, the emotions that can happen, and the energy goes out and gets imprinted, and someone later uh, can read that out. So here you have the same, the same fact, the fact that there is a lot of death cases in the old literature is interpreted in two different ways. Some people say, well, it's death, that means a spirit is there doing, doing things. Others will say, yeah, death happened and that caused some energy to remain there that is later affecting the environment. So that, that's another uh, possible explanation. Other people even talk about telepathy. There was a psychical researcher of the 19th century, Frank Podmore, that didn't believe in any of the above explanations. And he said, what happens here is that people that come to the house, the, the people that originally live in the house and know the story of what happened, they later move and new people come in. And these people that are living now in a different place, telepathically, are affecting at a distance the new owners of the house. So all those ghosts that they're seeing are basically caused by telepathy from the people that knew about the deaths and the problems that the house had before. That's again another way of explaining it. So here we have, you know, many different interpretations and the thing is what to do with, it, with them. Well, in reality, none of them can be said to be established. But I think a, a very useful way of seeing these things is to take it like Bozzano said in the old days, a more recent parapsychologist, Carly Olsis, who died, died a few years ago, uh, was arguing, was the idea that like, let's take, they will say, let's take all these ideas one by one and see how the cases that we have on record uh, fit into the ideas. And the, the, the general concept being that maybe we should not try to say that one of these concepts explains everything. That maybe we're dealing with a whole different types of hauntings. That some hauntings may be spirits of the dead, but others may be just a replay of energy stored in the environment. The thing is how to make a difference. You have to go case by case and study the features of the case. W one example is the whole issue, are apparitions, these ghosts that we have been talking about, like the Cheltenham ghost, or that apparition that we saw in the, you know, the young girl, you know, with the wreath, the blonde girl in, in the videotape, are those conscious, discarnate people? Are, are those spirits there, standing there thinking, here I am, I'm a spirit, I'm visiting the hotel, let's see who I'm going to scare now. You know, they're conscious that they are beings and they're going to interact with you. Uh, a lot of spiritists and spiritists will say that's what happens and that's what explains the intentionality of the manifestations and the spirit is trying to communicate, is trying to ask for something, or is just having a great time. But the, the issue is there is a real entity there thinking. If that's the case, you should get certain type of phenomena like attempts to communicate. If you bring a medium, there should be an intelligent communication. You should, you should expect certain intentional phenomena Similar to if you yourself were in a room and you wanted to do all those, all those acts. You know, you have a motivation, so you have to look for phenomena that show motivation. And there are cases like that. You know, there are cases where in a haunted house, uh, the objects that get moved or affected are the objects that were related to the person that died. But the other objects that are more neutral and don't have much interest, they're not affected as often. That will be the type of thing consistent with the idea that there is some consciousness trying to manifest. And of course, some of the cases where there is some attempt of communication, more direct through raps, you know, sounds like this, or through the apparition, and they're not so frequent, but they exist. Cases like that, you have to look to support the, that model. If you go for the trace theory, where the idea is that figure that is there, or whatever is there, doesn't have any consciousness. It's just a playback, like a magnetic tape. There is information stored, but there is no entity there thinking consciously that they're going to do anything. If that is the case, 
then the theorists will say, well, we should find out cases where the ghost is a mechanical figure. You just see a ghost that walks from one corner to the other, never talks to you, never looks at you. If you are in front of it, it will go through you, or it will not acknowledge your presence. And the phenomena seem to be kind of one after the other with no, no specific sense. Also with, with routines. There are many cases, you know, where you, you hear the same sounds over and over again. The figure is in the same place. The psychometric theory will exactly ex predict that. You will expect that. Because that energy is there, there is no consciousness, and it's a replay. It's only a replay all the time. Unless you admit that some new energy can cause a new change in that, uh, in that drama. But generally people don't postulate that. They just expect that it will be repetitive, almost without meaning. And there are cases like that as well. You know, there are many cases of apparitions that seem to be like that. The Cheltenham one was mostly that type of apparition, but not completely. And that's what makes these cases so difficult. That just when you think, aha, uh -huh, here I have, you know, this good idea, then the cases start having exceptions and they don't all fit. So uh, through all these years, we have not been able to really, you know, find one model even that we think that explains everything that just doesn't exist. But at the very least, I think we can say that, that we have some ideas that seem to apply to some of the cases. In more recent times, perhaps because of technology, the new idea is the whole thing about electromagnetism. The defenders of electromagnetism will say, we have shown, and there is some evidence for that, that in many of these haunted houses, when you go and measure the ambient electromagnetic activity in the house, and electromagnetism is not a parapsychological phenomenon per se. You know, the electromagnetism is all around us. In the lights around us, the planet Earth generates uh, electromagnetic currents. That's, that's part of life all around us. Uh, but what people are finding is that in places where there are haunting phenomena, senses of presence, apparitions, many other things like that, the electromagnetic activity of that house seems to be higher than that in other houses. There's still a lot more research to be done, but that seems to be a consistent pattern. And then the, the researchers say, okay, but what's the meaning of that? Some of them say, okay, what happens here is electromagnetism, if it's really strong, is causing hallucinations in your brain. As simple as that. So your brain is being scrambled, it's affected, and you smell things that are really not there. You see things that are not really there, but it's because all that energy is affecting your nervous system and inducing these things. Some group of people uh, believe that. But again, that doesn't apply so well in so many cases. I, I think that's extremely simplistic for cases where many people see the apparition at the same time, cases that are more complicated. It certainly doesn't seem to fit the, the bill for a lot of cases. But then other people say, okay, the electromagnetism is there, but uh, what we are seeing is that electromagnetism is combined with the parapsychological aspect of the case. So maybe these energies that remain in the house uh, are electromagnetic in nature or are related to the electromagnetic potential of the environment. And, and that's basically where the state of the situation is, where people just don't know. They just have some crude measurements, but if, if that means something more, it's, it's very subjective. You know, where, what do you do with that information from then on? And that's what science basically tries to do. You get all those facts, and you try to fit them in all the possible models. Sometimes there are things that fit neatly, but in the case of haunted houses, there is nothing neat, you know. Things are very hard to, to fit. And well, the, to summarize the, the controversy, we basically don't have a very clear explanation. But some cases are very appealing, say, from the spirit point of view. Cases that seem to have intentions, seem to have specific characteristics, seem to be very hard to explain in any other way. Some of the impressions of the medium sometimes come together with the testimony of the people that live in the house and with the observations of the researchers. So then you have like three strands of evidence coming together to support a particular explanation. In this, in this case, maybe the spirit one. But it's very hard to be sure of that. When you see someone like we saw with the, the globes of light, someone saying, these are the souls of human beings here. Well, it could be, but a lot of this, this phenomena could also be pure electro electromagnetic manifestations that are not necessarily the, the production or the product of, of, of spirit action. 
there, there has been at least one study that was done by William Roll and Andrew Nichols in which they were present when they saw this big ball of light come in and it was very clearly there. They filmed it, they saw it, and they happened to have uh, detectors of electromagnetic uh, energy. They have a long probe and one of them basically approached the light and stuck the thing inside. You know, so something long like this, they just put it in there and, and they basically showed that that ball was electromagnetic in nature. So there is growing evidence for that, but if that is, means something else, their methods do not allow them to, to make that jump. And that's the problem, you know, that we have there, that we have cases that are better for something, but not good for the other. And it's ex an extremely subjective thing. A lot of the people that are skeptical of the spirit interpretation generally have not had the experiences of those that defend the action of spirits. Mainly people that go there, like, like the person that we saw there uh, that was having all those sensations. Most researchers, most people that go don't have that. They don't have the sensibility. But, so that person will, he believes firmly that these are spirits because when he walks in there, he feels a hand touching him. He sees faces, he hears voices. For him, that's a personal action. That, that's not just an indeterminate energy. But other people go there more with instruments and when they detect are the energies. So you can see that experience is different for each of them. And of course, they form their different interpretation of, of the phenomena. So right now, we are in a state that is, is very difficult to see you know, how further developments will, will proceed. Uh, I will not say that any of the particular models can be completely rejected, completely accepted. I think for specific cases, some of them fit better than others. But it's the type of thing that we really need to do much more research to understand what is happening. Research that is done in an intelligent way, not just go there with a camera just to take any picture, but you go in there and if you find certain types of manifestations, you, you try to work with them exploring a possible explanation. So if you believe that that's a real spirit, you go in on the, that assumption and do your research with mediums, with whatever way you want, to try to put to test, like asking questions about the phenomena. If you're a spirit, what type of things can you do? You make your hypothesis and, and put the phenomena to test. Or if you are just a ball of energy that has no consciousness, that is just floating there, what type of manifestation should we expect? Work like that, I think, can be done right now with a lot of the cases that has been, have been collected. You know, you, you could present, okay, if, if all these ghosts are only energy and nothing more, then we should get only these non-intelligent manifestations. So if you find intelligent manifestations, then you say, oh, this is not consistent with the simple energy model. And then that, that's the way that you start going in and rejecting and seeing if you can reject all the cases or show that there are subtypes of cases, which is the idea that I, I tend to lean more, that, that this is a big phenomenon, like many medical conditions that have different causes, but the symptoms look the same. What we have here are different processes. A lot of the old theoreticians, like Ernesto Bozzano, also, he was mainly a spiritist. He, he was always saying that all these phenomena have different explanations. You know, some of them are the psychic faculties of human people. Others are discarnate spirits. And he will go case by case. You know, he will just study the case and say, I believe this one fits better the pattern than the other. And I think that even today, you know, after, after all this stuff that has been done, we are in the same position. And the, the idea is, okay, let's, let's do more casework, let's collect more cases, and let's see what, what order can we put into, into all this, uh, this uh, seemingly chaos of, of manifestation. But at the same time, uh, I think we should not forget that also we want to explain and understand we also have other things to do with these cases. One of them is to help the people that are going through these experiences. As we said before, you know, a lot of these persons really need more counsel or even clinical help than research. So in, instead of just trying to go in and explain and search for a theory, we sometimes have to consider this other aspect, which is we need to help these people first. And then secondary will be the issue of understanding the phenomena. Because if they're calling us to go to their houses, many times what they want is help. They don't want just to see a scientific paper coming out later saying, oh, it was a ball of energy, that's great. That doesn't help people. So we have to have a proper balance of dealing with the needs of people, what we can do for them, and then the explanation. 
uh, both things are not separate. If you understand a phenomena in more detail, you can obviously do things to help people more. It's like in clinical psychology, if you understand the nature of clinical problems such as depression, if you know what depression is in the neurochemistry, the psychology of it, you are able to help someone better than if you don't have that specific knowledge. There are specific treatments that are based on the details that we have learned through scientific research. The same may be said about these things, you know. If at some point we show that these energies, say, have a limit, or that these energies may be dissipated by a particular procedure, then using that procedure we just go into the house and we dissipate the energies and we <coughs> help the family if that's what they want. So research, it has to go in some ways together with the counseling and the helping part. The problem is that sometimes they seem in contradiction in one and the other. But again, that's just in a, in a, in a short uh, summary how I see the problem of explaining uh, hauntings. Certainly, like many things in parapsychology, and especially when we get issues of survival of death, the final word is, is basically a personal interpretation. We cannot say, you know, that we have shown scientifically completely this, just as the skeptic says, we have shown that nothing like this exists. You know, we have to avoid this 100% type of naive, I think, explanations and be more sensitive about the complexity and variety of the phenomena and, uh, and basically try to see, admitting the reality of how difficult things are, how we can move on and what else can be done. This in a way what concludes this part of the lecture and now I will be happy to open it to questions and go back to some of the issues that you had. <laughs> Hi there, my name is Lisa Coley and I serve as president of Parapsychology Foundation. I want to welcome you to the Foundation's YouTube channel. There's already a wealth of information available posted and we have plans to continue to post our classic lectures and new materials so you don't want to miss out. So hit that bell, please subscribe and you'll be notified and hope you enjoy. <laughs>